What price Merry Christmas? Santa has become a captain of industry, modern stockings won't hang up, and the plum pudding's gone prohibition. By Edward Longstreth. Drawings by George Shanks. So this is Christmas. Merry Christmas. Well, it may be Christmas, but if it's merry, a pain in the neck is bliss. Ye olde yuletide has become a washout. We ought to have sense enough to stop selling ourselves so much Christmas spirit with such high-pressure salesmanship, and get back to the old idea of just having a swell time with a lot of good friends. It's time we tumbled to the fact that we'll never get a better present from Susie than the one we sent her. She's wise. There's no chance of making on the exchange. Better give up. It's time we conquered the fear that the janitor will burn us out of house and home if we don't give him his annual bribe. We ought to, really. But will we? We have almost killed Christmas with kindness, the cost of kindness being what it is. Imagine the ancient Christmas in dear old Merry England. All is cold but serene. They drag in the Yule log across the virgin snow, for they had virgin snow in those days. The door of the manor is flung open. There stands Milady herself, the original Milady of the advertisements, her hands somewhat raw and red from the cold, her nose bearing token of a cold in the head, her lovely form coddled into half a dozen quilted petticoats. She gives words of cheer to the varlets, and they cheer back. Some carry armfuls of holly and mistletoe and branches of spruce. They barbecue all the animals they can lay hands on, eat the meat to the last scrap, and wash it down with pitchers of ale and wine until they sink into a delightful stupor, which the cold, the smoke, and the pangs of digestion are powerless to interrupt. That was Christmas. And now what? The last chance for a Merry Christmas passed away when the Puritans reformed and turned the old homestead into a house of correction. Away went the Christmas punch. Away went the wassail of Whoopi. The family dinner in our pure, repentant land is now a rodeo. Some swell bulldozing and roping, but no gaiety. Even in the days of dear Mr. Dickens, there were toasts beneath the holly and dalliance under the mistletoe, and Tiny Tim could actually say, God bless us, everyone, without anybody throwing a chair at his head. Now we sit down to the family dinner, nine-tenths of us cold sober, a feeling of austere dread gripping our hearts. With tense muscles, we clutch our chairs and nervously sip ice water, waiting for the annual crack old Aunt Kate takes at Cousin Prue. That will start the ball rolling of conversation bounding with large, uncontrollable bounds. Tiny Tim, now grown a bit adolescent and more knowing, struggles to his feet, throws an empty flask on the table, and as he nears the exit, shouts back at the family his parting, profane version of the old Dickens hokum. His sally saves the day. Aunt Kate and Cousin Prue unite in common righteousness to lament the wicked generation which they have raised. The family dinner is not the only change in Christmas a la 1929. We have made Santa Claus a captain of industry. His bag of toys has been turned into carload lots. The original idea was to give presents to the kids, then our modern gold digger saw her chance and just wouldn't grow up. The girlfriends are a bit calloused about the whole gift end of it. Would some power the gifty to give him? If it's more blessed to give than to receive, let the boyfriends get the blessing. What the girls want is plenty of receiving. About the first week in December, they sit up late at night penning gay, friendly little letters to all the boys who have so much as cast them a passing glance during the past year. Christmas is just another harvest home for Papa's baby girl. But even the girls have families and girlfriends, and feel they must give somebody something. At best, of course, it is only a swap. Watch the face of anyone who has spent $2.50 on a present for a friend, who has not so much as sent a card in return, and see how much the spirit of giving has to do with it. It's all furious Fanny can do to keep from falling on her knees and praying the avenging angels to do their stuff. Not that I string along with those misguided souls who want to join the Society for the Prevention of Useless Giving. No one wants to bother about the size of Dora's shoes. Fancy little Wilhelmina's expression when her eyes light on a pair of mittens and a brand new box of cereal the first thing Christmas morning. If I had my way about it, I'd give all the girlfriends the most useless thing I could find and make them happy. I would consider it an insult to have anyone say, Oh, how sweet of you, it's just what I need. Well, $1.64 is just what I need to pay the gas bill, but I'd pan anybody who gave me a gas receipt for Christmas. What I want is a new pipe, and I don't need one at all. The happy words to hear tinkle and fall from the girlfriend's lips are, Oh, you darling, that's just what I wanted. Modern Christmas lasts too long. 
It begins about the middle of October, with the greeting card headache. The decorations break out in November, and by Christmas, they look like last year's hat. As for tacking on anything about a Happy New Year to the annual irony, who thought of that? A dandy chance you have of being happy or even prosperous next year with the bills coming in early as larks on January 2nd. And anyone who thinks the piper is paid with January bills is just an old Nance. The financial outgo begins early in December, and I don't care how many charge accounts you have. There is the janitor, and the ice man, the postman, the milkman, the grocer's boy, and if you are not very careful, the grocer himself. They all get so flirtatious as Christmas draws near, you can hardly tell whether to tip them or marry them. But hence loathe the melancholy. Let's be gay. Over the hours spent standing in line at the post office, let us draw a veil. Christmas shopping comes but once a year. The old Christmas trappings no more fit into our modern scheme of things than a dinosaur fits into a birdcage. What have Yule logs to do with steam radiators, or flaming plum pudding with acts of congress? What we need is a Christmas that is up to date. What we need is a Merry Christmas. It used to be a good time had by all. Now it's just a prolonged headache. Like a lot of old zanies, we still sing, Hi ho the holly, at so much per holly, and so much per hi ho. We bring in the pudding with bits of red crepe paper fluttering on it to kid the folks into thinking of brandy. We even try to keep up the quaint custom of hanging up stockings and telling the kiddies St. Nick will come flying through the air with a sleigh and reindeer. Imagine that, a sleigh and reindeer. What do you suppose a kid thinks of that when his mind has been dwelling on the new transcontinental air record and the latest model passenger plane? A sleigh and reindeer belong to the past tense and the past ages. Lindbergh has put Santa Claus, and the methods that once made Santa Claus famous, out of the young mind. And the carrying possibilities of the modern airplane, anyway, would capsize an old-time sleigh. Besides, who ever heard of a flying sleigh? Children aren't morons, really. And modern stockings won't hang up. Try stuffing goodies and toys, or even candy and bracelets, into a pair of stockings you have to creep into with silk gloves for fear of unraveling $3 worth of spiderweb before you can say Merry Christmas. Just try it. Probably Christmas in the Hawaiian Islands is the best of all. There, there is no possibility of snow and sleighs and yule logs, no fireplaces and no hanging of stockings. There, it is just another day, a bit more happy than the others and very much more embellished with food. Yes, and with drink. It's an old Hawaiian custom. But with us, the old ways are strong and perhaps not to be changed. The idea, after all, is just to make the best of it and save your grouch and wisecracks for the family reunion. You'll need them. And so Merry Christmas to all, and try and get it.